What I found, Robert, just astonished me. I, I found that the standard model in contemporary astrophysics was that the universe had an absolute beginning at a point in the finite past before which literally nothing existed. Welcome to Closer to Truth, where we explore deep questions of existence, including arguments for and against the existence of God, and if there were a God, what might follow. Closer to Truth promotes no privileged position. Rather, we seek precision and clarity in diverse, even conflicting ideas, and we do not mind challenging current belief. I am speaking with William Lane Craig about his philosophical theology research projects over the course of his career. Here, the Kalam cosmological argument that the world, the universe, had a beginning and that God created the world ex nihilo out of nothing. Bill has authored or edited over 30 books, including the Kalam cosmological argument and theism, atheism, and Big Bang cosmology. He was ranked by academicinfluence.com as the 10th most influential philosopher and the third most influential theologian in the world. Bill, great to see you. Let's start with your conclusion. Please describe the Kalam cosmological argument. The Kalam cosmological argument is an attempt to answer the question, did the universe have a beginning? And if so, why? And I argue that the universe, in fact, is finite in the past, had an absolute beginning, and therefore there must be a transcendent cause beyond the universe that brought it into being. And an analysis of what attributes this cause must have leads me to think that it is an uncaused, um, changeless, spaceless, timeless, enormously powerful personal creator of the universe. What was the driving motivation to commit years of research and writing to this project? That, that concept has been, is, is well part of the Abrahamic religions broadly. Um, what was your motivation to begin the project? Well, ever since I was a boy, I have been intrigued by the question of the origin of the universe. Where did the universe come from? Did it begin to exist? Or did it just go back and back and back forever? And in my university studies, I discovered that this was an argument that had occupied some of the greatest minds in Western philosophy. And it was in reading the defense of the cosmological argument that I became absolutely captivated by this version of the argument and decided that if I did a doctoral thesis in philosophy, I would write on this argument. And that dream came true. And uh, as a result of that work, uh, three books came out of that study uh, in defense of this argument for a creator of the universe. Going in, what were your grounding assumptions of beliefs, doctrinal commitments that were sacrosanct and inviolable so that they constrained how you viewed the, the data? You know, I, I don't think I had any, uh, Robert, because when you're dealing with an argument of so-called natural theology, it could be sound or unsound. It, it doesn't matter. So it's independent of your own personal beliefs. Um, I just wanted to weigh whether or not there were any good reasons to think that the universe is not infinite in the past, but had a beginning. Uh, what were your initial questions that you asked? Did you have a, a series of issues that you wanted to explore in yeah. order to probe this? Well, initially it was philosophical. Is it possible for there to have been an infinite regress of prior events going into the past. Um, but in the course of the study, I thought, you know, I have some vague knowledge that contemporary cosmology posits a big bang. I wonder if this could provide any sort of empirical confirmation of these arguments. And so I began to read contemporary cosmology. And what I found, Robert, just 
astonished me. I, I found that the standard model in contemporary astrophysics was that the universe had an absolute beginning at a point in the finite past before which literally nothing existed. And so there was not only good philosophical arguments for the finitude of the past, but there were good scientific arguments as well. As that standard model has developed, of course, the concept of a multiverse has emerged that now, even since you you did the book, and which was your first uh, first work, I think it was in the 1970s, um, yeah. that now the multiverse has uh, come into the standard model, which would give, in some sense, the possibility that our universe is some some uh, expression of a of a of, of a of a squeezing off of some prior universe. So we'd see a big bang, but there were things before that. How, how does that affect uh, your reflection on the Kalam uh, cosmological argument? That's that's absolutely correct. And the question is, can that inflationary process be extended to past infinity? And one of the important um, results. Uh, has been the uh, board guth Vilenkin theorem developed in 2003 uh, that showed that this inflationary process uh, cannot be extended to infinity and that therefore even if you have this series of bubble universes being generated over time, the process can be infinite in the future, but it cannot be infinite in the past. And so to date, uh, I can say with some confidence that there are no empirically tenable models of a universe with an infinite past. You use the term empirically, which gives you great protection because it's very difficult as you get into the modern theories of cosmology to uh, to, to have observations of, a, of empirical nature. Um, but uh, if you go further... empirical models, but the question is, not only are these models mathematically consistent, but are they realistic explanations of the universe in which we live? Sure. Uh, going further, there are many other theories, some of which are compatible with inflationary theories, some of which are, are distinctive from it. Uh, the concept of brain, B-R-A-N-E, cosmology, where you have universes embedded in a higher dimensional brain in some sense, and then occasionally if they touch each other, you would have a big bang explosion um, and, and without any requirement that brain higher dimensions have to have a, a, a finitude of the past. Well, again, this model developed by uh, Neil Turok and uh, Steinhardt um, called the Ekpyrotic Cyclic Model turns out that it can't be extended to the infinite past. You can have previous uh, universes, but it can't be extended to infinity and be consistent with the laws of physics. And this has been the pattern. One model after another has been proposed to avoid the beginning posited in the standard model. And one after another, it's been shown that they cannot be extended to past infinity. Does the Kalam cosmological argument depend on the tensed theory of time, so-called the A ah. theory? Time is real, time flows, the present is special, because this is less a, um, a definitive sense of, of many modern physicists. Yes, this is a good question. I myself am committed to a tensed theory of time. I think that temporal becoming is an objective feature of reality. And so to supplement my work on the Kalam cosmological argument, I wrote a two-volume series on the tenseless and tensed theory of time in which I defend the superiority of the tensed theory of time. However, others such as the um, Hong Kong philosopher um, Andrew Loke have defended the Kalam cosmological argument using a tenseless theory of time. So, some of the argumentation would have to be jettisoned if you abandon a tensed theory of time, I think. But the whole argument uh, could still survive, uh, though I think it would be less powerful.
you also, I think, must de deny special relativity's foundational assertion that there is a preferred reference frame, uh, which special relativity famously denies, but that you uh, ha embed and then have to explain in a, a neo Lorentzian concept of time dilation or, or, or shrinkage of, uh, of space. Yeah, it's important to understand that there are uh, different interp physical interpretations of the mathematical core of special relativity. And uh, I think that H.A. Lorentz, who collaborated with Einstein, continued to lecture on relativity theory well after the special and general theories have been developed, had the better line on this where he said, that there is such a thing as absolute simultaneity, absolute length, but that these are not measurable by us because of our uh, being in various inertial frames uh, whereby we cannot detect whether we're at rest or in motion. And these different interpretations of relativity theory are empirically equivalent uh, and therefore cannot be decided scientifically, although there is very recent evidence that comes out of quantum theory that I think strongly supports a neo-Lorentzian view of relativity theory. Does the Kalab cosmological argument depend on that uh, distinction and having a, a definitive uh, reference frame? No, I, I, don't, I don't see that it would. Um, this is my attempt to understand relativity theory given a tensed theory of time, but that's not um, that's not at the heart of the Kalam cosmological argument. No, some critics would say that you uh, choose your science to support your theology. Uh, you like <laughs> Big Bang cosmology because it gives you a a, a beginning, and and you don't like relativity because it it, it, it affects not only there's no abs, absolute reference frame, but it, it suggests a, uh, a tenseless approach to time. Right, but that's a philosophical question, Robert. I think that a tense theory of time is best integrated with relativity theory by adopting a neo-Lorentzian physical interpretation. And that, that's a perfectly legitimate philosophical point of view that quite an a few physicists, a minority decidedly, but a few physicists today would also take. There are some uh, uh, theologians, uh, scientific theologians, I think John Polkenhorn uh, told me that uh, although Big Bang cosmology is certainly the dominant feature, it, it wouldn't hurt his theology if that were not the case, if there were and in the infinitude of the past, if that were the case, because still then you would have to ask where that whole that whole uh, uh, corpus came from. Uh, so to him, the question was an interesting one, but it it it, it had no critical um, uh, critical impact on how he saw his uh, his God and his relationship between science and religion. Yeah, that's a very typical. Uh, point of view, it insulates your theology from falsification by science. I would say that the doctrine of creatio ex nihilo is taught in the Bible, and that therefore, as Christians, we are committed to the truth of that, and that that requires that the universe is not past eternal. Now, if it were, that doesn't do anything to disprove the existence of God. God could still be the ground of being for an eternal universe, but it would mean that the biblical doctrine of creation was wrong. Bill, thank you very much. I love this stuff. Let's do more. Okay. <laughs> we invite viewers to watch Closer to Truth videos with William Lane Craig at closertotruth.com or Closer to Truth YouTube channel. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing.